from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Lost Door by Dorothy Quick I've often wondered whether I would have urged Rexler to come with me if I had known what Rougemont would do to him. I think looking back that even if I could have glimpsed the future, I would have acted in the same way and that I would have brought him to Rougemont to fulfill his destiny. As the boat cut its swift way through the waters on its journey to France, I had no thought of this, nor had Rexler. He was happier than I had ever seen him. He had never been abroad before and the boat was a source of wonder and enjoyment to him. I myself was full of an eager anticipation of happy months to come. It hardly seemed possible that only a week had elapsed since I received the cable that had made such a change in my fortunes. It read, Your father died yesterday. You are sole heir provided you comply with conditions of his will, the principal one being that you spend six months of each year at Rougemont if satisfactory, come at once. It was signed by my father's lawyer. I had no sorrow over my father's passing except a deep regret that we could not have known the true relationship of father and son. At the death of my mother, my father had grown bitter and refused to see the innocent cause of her untimely passing. As a baby, I had been brought up in the lodge of Rougemont, my father's magnificent chateau near Vichy. When I reached the age of four, I had been sent away to boarding school. After that, my life had been a succession of schools, first in France, the adopted land of my father, then England, and finally St. Paul's in America. In all justice to my parent, I must admit he gave me every advantage except the affection I would have cherished. By his own wish, I had never seen him in life, nor would I see him in death for a later cable advised me that the funeral was over and his body already at rest in the beautiful Gothic mausoleum he had built in his lifetime after the manner of the ancients. He had left me everything with only two injunctions, that a certain sum of money be set aside to keep the chateau always in its present condition and that I should spend at least half my time in it and my children after me, a condition that I was only too pleased to accept. All my life I had longed for a home. I cabled at once that I would sail. A return cable brought me the news that I had unlimited funds to draw upon. It was then that I urged Rexler to come with me. Rexler and I had been friends since the days when two lonely boys had been put by chance into the same room at school. We were so utterly unlike, it was perhaps the difference between us that held us together through the years. At St. Paul's and later at Princeton, Gordon Rexler had always been at the head of his class, whereas I inevitably tagged along at the bottom. The contrast between us was expressed not only in the color of our hair and eyes, but also in our disposition. My greatest gift from fate was a sense of humor, and I suppose it was this quality of mind that particularly appealed to Rexler. It seems as though I was the only one who could lift him out of the despondency into which he often plunged. As the years passed and his tendency to depression intensified, he came to depend more and more upon me, and we grew closer together. Strangely enough, the whiteness of his face and the gloom that exuded from him did not detract from his good looks. It only added to them, for the translucence of his skin made the thick black hair that lay close to his head all the darker while at the same time I brought out the deep black of his eyes and the firm cut of his lips. The night before we landed, 
We were standing on deck at the rail, looking over the side, straining our eyes for the first glimpse of the lights of Cherbourg, and Rexler spoke of himself for the first time since we had left New York. You know, Jim, for perhaps the only time in my life, I feel at peace as though something that I should have done long ago has been at last accomplished. He was so solemn that I laughed a little. He stopped me suddenly. It's true. I've always felt an urge within me, a blinding force pushing me towards something that is waiting for me. Where, I do not know. What, I have no idea. For the first time, it's gone. That nameless urge that I knew not how to satisfy, and I feel that the call's being answered. With the usual inanity of people at a loss for words, I said the first thing that came into my mind. Perhaps Rougemont has been calling you. You've no idea what a relief it is, he continued, not to feel constantly pulled, with no way of knowing toward what or how to go about answering the summons. I've often thought that I should take my life, that that was what was meant. His voice trailed off. This time I was not at a loss for words. I started to read him a lecture that would have done credit to Martin Luther or John Knox. At the end of my harangue, Rexler laughed, a rare thing for him, and put his arm through mine. All that's gone now. Didn't I tell you that at last, in some strange way, I am at peace? Rougemont's towers were visible long before we reached the great iron gates that had to be swung open to let us pass. For miles, the great edifice dominated the landscape. The huge building had a soft reddish tinge from which I suppose it derived its name, Red Mountain. It was a fairy tale palace perched on a mountain top. A great thrill went through me as I realized that this beautiful chateau was mine, and as we drove through the gates up the winding road, through my own force, the pride of possession swelled up in me, and for the first time I began to understand why my father had never put his foot outside the great gates and the high wall that enclosed the acres that now belonged to me. As we drove on up the winding narrow road over the drawbridge that spanned the moat into the courtyard, I understood more and more. Here was everything, beauty such I had never dreamed Forest stocked with game, running brooks full of fish, a lake, and further off, a farm. I could glimpse its thatched roofs. To supply our wants, Rougemont was a world in itself. The high-carved door was swung open as Rexler and I got out of the car. Monsieur de Carrier, my father's lawyer, advanced to meet us, a friendly smile on his Santa Claus countenance. I shook hands, introduced Rexler as a very good friend who is going to stay with me. Monsieur Carrier's face fell. Clearly, Rexler being with me was a disappointment. Nevertheless, he greeted him politely as he ushered us in. That moment, Rougemont took me to its heart and won me for its own. Imagine Amboise or any of the great French chateaux suddenly restored to itself as it was in the days of the Medici, and you have a small idea of Rougemont, for we had stepped out of the present into the past. Carrier, Rexler, and I were anachronisms. Everything else was in keeping with the dead centuries. Even the servants were in doublet and hose of a sort of cerulean blue with gray slashes puffed with crimson silk. I think I gasped. At any rate, Monsieur Carrier saw my in astonishment. It is your father's will, my boy. He always kept it so and wore the costume of former days himself. He greatly admired the first Francis. In your rooms, you'll find costumes that are prepared for you. For the last six months of his life, he was making ready for his son. There was an odd sort of pride in Carrier's voice. I remember now that my father had written for my measurements. I had thought he meant to make a present, but when time passed and I heard nothing, the incident had slipped from my mind. I looked at Rexler, expecting to see some sign of amusement on his face, but he stood quietly looking at the tapestry that hung halfway up the grand stairway. There was a dreamy, faraway expression in his eyes. May I speak before your friend, Carrier asked. I nodded. The servants had already disappeared with our luggage. I threw myself down on the long, low bench in Carrier, 
sat opposite me. You understand the terms of your father's will, of course, Carrier began, that you must live here six months. But you did not know that you must live here as he did in the past. If you do not, then Rougemont goes to your father's steward with the same conditions, to be kept always as it is, with only a small sum set aside for you. I said nothing. Driving along the road from Paris, it would have seemed fantastic, but here, under the spell of Rougemont, it seemed as though anything else could be possible. Carrier went on. You will be Grand Seigneur, Lord of the Manor in the old style. You may have your guests if you like, but they too must conform with the rules. Here he glanced at Rexler, who still stood as though he were in a trance. The other six months you are free to do as you please. Spend what you like of the money not needed for Rougemont, that is, if you want to go anywhere else. Evidently he had finished his speech. At the time I did not recognize the significance of his last words. I am willing to submit to the conditions only a sudden thought struck me. I don't want to lose all touch with the outside world. Can I go to Vichy to get papers and so forth? I don't suppose they had papers in France's first time. Monsieur de Carrier smiled. My dear boy, your father didn't wish to make a prisoner of you. You may go to Vichy if you like, but you must not be away from Rougemont more than 24 consecutive hours during the six months you are in residence. So far as the papers, etc., are concerned, they will be at the lodge. There's also a telephone, and your own clothes will be kept there. After tonight, nothing of 1935 must come within these halls. But you are free to go to the lodge anytime you want to. You can get in touch with me also if you desire further information. De Lacy, the steward, will look out for you. He knows your father's ways. Now permit me to congratulate you and say au revoir, my young friend. Monsieur de Carrier got up on his stubby fat legs, made a little bow to me, another to Rexler, which went unheeded. I too arose. It will seem strange, but I'll do my best. One other thing, Monsieur de Carrier was all of a sudden very grave. In two weeks' time, you'll be given a key. It unlocks a casket found in the library. In it, you will find a message from your father. Adieu, my boy. I wish you well. With a click of his heels and a friendly smile, he was gone. I turned to Rexler. What do you think of it? I asked. Rexler did not answer. He still stood gazing up the stairways. The wide marble steps curved upward. Along the sides, the intricate carving was beautiful in its lacy delicateness. At that moment, however, I was alarmed for my friend. His attitude was rigid and his eyes were glassy. I put my hand on his shoulder. Rexler! My action galvanized him to life. Another minute and she would have reached the last step. Now she is gone. This was madness. There had been no one there. I said as much. Rexler turned and faced me. But there was, he said eagerly, the most beautiful girl I've ever seen all done up in some old costume great wide skirts, little waist, and a high lace collar. She had bronze curls, great blue eyes, and the loveliest face. I saw her immediately we came in. She looked at both of us, but she smiled at me. I was in a quandary. Until now, I had not given the staircase more than a perfunctory glance. For all I knew, she might have been one of the servants peeping to see her new master. To Rexler, impressionable, strange creature that he was, the one glance might have so registered on his mind that he kept on seeing her, for certainly she had not been there when I looked. It seemed best to make light of the whole matter. Anyway, she's gone now. At least I can explain the costume. I take it you didn't hear Carrier's announcements? Rexler shook his head. I proceeded to enlighten him. Instead of teasing me about the strange condition my father's wallet imposed upon me, he was enthusiastic about the idea. It's the one period in history that has always interested me. Jim, we're in luck. Imagine stepping back into Medici, France for six months, shutting out the world. 
Who knows but that Catherine herself may have stayed here, or Marguerite de Valois, the Marguerite of Marguerites, beautiful, but no more beautiful than that girl on the stairs. I can hardly wait to see her again. I hardly hope that he would see her and that she was not entirely a creature of his imagination. If she was real, I too was eager to meet her. Rexler interrupted my thoughts. I feel as though I had come home, he said. I'm crazy to explore. Let's go shed these ugly things and begin to really live. Why? It's been this I've been waiting for. It's lucky we're the same size. Out of his irrelevance, I gathered the trend of his thought. I wonder where we go, I began. Almost as though he had heard my words, a tall commanding figure stepped into the hall. He was attired richly in the mask of a lovely soft blue with the same slashes of crimson that the servant livery had shown, but in this case of finer material. He was a handsome man of about thirty-four. His beard was pointed and he had a small mustache. His long legs were encased in silken hose and he wore a dagger thrust through his belt. De Lacy, at your service, my lord, he announced as he made a deep bow. I extended my hand somewhat at a loss to know how to greet my father, Stuart, who was clearly a man of some importance and who, but for me, would be owner of Rougemont. Instead of shaking hands, he dropped on one knee and kissed my hand, a proceeding which embarrassed me very much. On my motioning him to rise, he did so with a lithe grave. I suppose you want to change your strange clothes, my lord, and see your quarters? I nodded and introduced Rexler. De Lacy bowed. Monsieur Rexler would like to be near you. Then he added, We have some twenty or thirty suites, my lord. Rexler said he would prefer to be close at hand, and together we followed De Lacy up the marble stairway into a new world. Rexler was at ease immediately in his doublet and hose. The rich embroidered garment seemed to suit him as modern clothes never did. He looked handsomer than ever. He also told me that the costume of the Medici was becoming to me. And truly, when I caught a glimpse of myself mirrored in the pound, for the Chateau did not possess a large mirror, I was not ill-pleased with the result. But by the end of the week, I still felt strange in my new attire, whereas Rexler, from the beginning, wore his as if to the manner born. But I anticipate. That first night, we donned two of the outfits which the valet whom De Lacy introduced to me had put out. Our own clothes disappeared, and much to my annoyance with them, my cigarettes. We ate dinner in state upon a raised dais at one end of a great hall. At either side below us were long, narrow tables filled with people. Dressed also in keeping with the period, they made a wonderful picture and comprised, I suppose, my court or retinue. De Lacy presented me to them with a flourish, and they all filed by and kissed my hand, then went to their places. When Rexler and I were seated, they too sat down. When I began to talk, they filled the hall with gay chattering. From a minstrel gallery at the other end of the room came soft strains of music. De Lacy stood behind me, pouring my wine. One thing I had noticed was that in the whole room, and there must have been two hundred people at least, there were no older men or women. In fact, De Lacy was the oldest of the lot. The others ranged from about sixteen to thirty. How did my father get all these people together? I asked De Lacy. Most of them, my lord, were born at Rougemont. Still others were adopted and brought here almost as soon as they were born. None of us has ever been outside Rougemont's gates. De Lacy was quite matter-of-fact as he made his statement. Rexler was searching the hall with his eyes as he listened to my steward. And you? I looked at De Lacy. I too, my lord, know nothing of your outside world, nor do I want to. Why should I? I am happy here. My family lives down at the farm, but His Highness, your father, became interested in me. He brought me into the chateau, had me educated, and looked after me himself. Eventually, he made me steward of Rougemont. It is a great honor he conferred upon me, and I shall do my best to help you, my lord. Of a sudden, I saw that my father's life work had been 
to rear court to people Rougemont. My father had been 25 at my mother's death. He had died at 58. He had 33 years to make his dream come true. Where are the parents of the ones who were born at Rougemont? At their own places or the farms, my lord. Rougemont has over a thousand acres and several manors upon it, where people whom his highness your father advanced over others live. They all serve their ruler in some way in return for what is given them. Only the people of the large are in touch with the outside, which we have been taught to look upon with scorn. Here we have everything, and to be taken to the chateau itself is the ambition of everyone on the estate. I saw it all, not of course every intricacy of the elaborate system my father had evolved, but at least a glimmer of truth, and I marveled at the character of a man who had taken children out of the world to make his own world and then had the patience to wait for them to grow up, to form his court, the court he planned for me. Yes, in my egotism, I thought it was for me. Two weeks were to pass before I learned what his real reason had been. Into my reflections, Rexler broke abruptly. She is not here. Ask the Lacey about her. Her beauty haunts me. Already I am in love with her. I was not surprised. Nothing I felt could at this point surprise me. So much had happened in the last few hours. If my father had arisen from the floor like Hamlet's ghost, I would have greeted him quite casually. Is there a young girl here with bronze curls and blue eyes? I asked obediently. A shadow crossed the Lacey's handsome face. For the first time he hesitated. There is no one here that answers that description. May I ask why you... My friend saw her on the stairway. I caught a murmur from the Lacey's lips. So soon, it sounded like, but before I could question further, he said aloud, I have to depart and join my lady. And before I could answer, he bowed himself away to take a seat at one of the tables below. Rutzler looked over his wine goblet. The man lied. I saw recognition of the description in his eyes. We'll get the truth out of him later, I countered. Isn't it fine to actually eat chicken with your fingers and not feel you're committing a social error? We did not get any information out of the Lacey later. To Rexler's insistent questioning, he was at first noncommittal and after a bit downright curt. I poured oil on the troubled water, so he's suggesting that as it was late, we would wait until morning to see the library and the left wing of the chateau. With a smile of relief, the Lacey ushered us to our chambers. My retiring was a kind of ceremony. It amused me, but I had a nagging little thought in the back of my mind that all this etiquette would become boring after a while. As the last man bowed himself out of my room, the Lacey bent low. My lord, there are guards at your door. You have only to call if you require anything. I thanked him once more. Greatly to my embarrassment, he again kissed my hand. Your servant to the death, he cried, and drew the curtains about my high canopy bed. I knew that outside the red damask, two huge candles were burning, but the curtains shut out their light and I was smothered in darkness. I made a mental note that I must arrange somehow for air in my room. The French idea of banishing night air did not coincide with my American habits. Tonight I was too weary to get up and attend to it. My thoughts were racing back and forth among the strange events of the day. But before I could focus them into any kind of order, sleep descended upon me. I had a strange dream. In it, the most beautiful woman I had ever seen came and parted the red damask curtains. Framed against the dark oak panels of my room, she stood looking down upon me. Her hair was red gold, and her eyes had all the sapphire tints of the world stored in their depths. Her pale white face was oval in shape and balanced perfectly upon a slender neck. Her lips were sweetly curved and her nose delicately shaped. As she bent over me, I could see the rounded curve of her bosom. One slim hand reached out and touched my cheek. It was like the touch of a fallen rose petal. In my dream, I lay asleep. Yet I was conscious of this lovely creature. I watched her through closed eyelids and held my breath, 
hoping she would kiss me. It seemed as though I had never desired anything so much. A half smile hovered on her lips, but her eyes told me nothing. She leaned lower. A faint perfume pervaded my senses and then I felt her lips upon my forehead. A great cold swept over me at her touch, swept me down, down into darkness and blackness and I knew no more. When I awoke, the sun was pouring through the open curtains. I reached for a cigarette, my first conscious thought upon awakening, and not finding my case under the pillow, suddenly realized my new surroundings. At the same time, I remembered my dream. Rexler and his talk of a red-haired beauty is responsible for that, I thought, as I clapped my hands. The lacy came in so quickly I knew he must have been waiting outside the door. He started when he saw the curtains of my bed had been open. Did you not pull them, I asked? He shook his head. I said no more, and the ceremony of my arising began. When I had bathed in a great sunken tub, fortunately Diana de Poitiers had her daily bath in the far-off time, I sought Rexler. Together we breakfasted, and then I announced to Lacey that we wished to inspect the rest of the chateau. He led us to the left wing and took us through suite after suite. Beautifully furnished, the chateau was a veritable treasure house. An antiquarian would have gone mad with delight. I noticed that the Lacey had avoided two heavily built doors opposite the ballroom. When we had returned from our tour, I stopped before them. And here, I asked. The picture gallery, my lord, he responded unwillingly, and swung the doors open. There was an unhappy expression on his face. The room was long and narrow, and the walls except for the windows were lined with portraits. We walked slowly down the length of the room, looking at the portraits of a dead and gone race. The former owners of the chateau, I asked. The lacy nodded. Suddenly, I looked at the part of the room facing the door which he had entered. At first, we had been too far away to distinguish anything about it except that there was only one large painting hanging in the center. Now that I was nearer, I could see the painting, and I caught my breath in astonishment, for there was the portrait of the lady of my dreams smiling down at me. Rexler caught my arm. That's the girl, the one I saw on the stairs. That is the portrait of Helene, Mademoiselle de Harcourt, daughter of the Lord of Harcourt, who owned this chateau. De Lacy's voice broke in. Rexler and I exclaimed simultaneously, but I, and she is, De Lacy looked at us strangely. It is from her that the chateau got its new name, Rougemont, Red Mountain. Before that it was called Hotel de Court. Mademoiselle Elaine was very beautiful, as you can see. Messieurs, and she had many suitors. At last, from among them, she chose an English lord, one of the discarded lovers, Black George, Le George Noir, vowed that she should not belong to the Englishman or ever leave Rougemont. She laughed, Mademoiselle Elaine, and her father, the Lord de Harcourt, laughed too, for he had many men at arms and was rich and powerful. Black George did not laugh. He only set his lips grimly. The wedding day came, and the beautiful Elaine married the English lord in the great hall. But just as he took her in his arms for the nuptial kiss, there rose a great noise outside. It was Black George attacking the chateau. The English lord, with Elaine's kiss warm upon his lips, sent forth to battle. There was a fight such as these peaceful lands had never seen. The mountain ran red with blood. Black George was the victor. He slew the Englishman. He slew the lord of Harcourt and his men hacked to pieces the defenders of the chateau. Black George, followed by his men, their swords red with blood, came into the great hall where Lane their court sat on the throne, her face whiter than her wedding dress. Black George flung her lover's body at her feet, and the women of the household who were crouched among the throne cried aloud with terror. The fair Lane did not cry, nor did she moan. She only looked straight at Black George, and there was that in her gaze that silenced everyone in the great hall. Even Black George stepped back a pace. Then Helene d'Arcourt rose 
and went down to her love, the English lord, who for a brief moment had been her husband. She knelt beside him and kissed his cold lips. Then she took her wedding veil and laid it over his body. All the while there was a silence in the great hall, while men and women watched the slim girl say farewell to the man she loved. They watched almost as though they were under a spell. But as the veil fell into place, Black George laughed, a long laugh that rang through the room. Then he turned to his followers and cried loudly, The women are yours. Take them as you will. All but that one who belongs to me. He gestured toward Elaine and laughed again. Elaine there at court stood erect and pointed her slender hand at Black George. Wait, she cried, and there was a quality in her voice that made her listeners tremble. I shall belong to no one until my lover comes for me. Until he comes, woe to you, Black George, who are well named. Woe to you and to all men, for I curse you with a mighty curse, the curse of a broken heart. And I curse all men for their black and bitter deeds. Year after year, century after century, I will take my vengeance for the wrongs I have suffered, and no man shall be free until my lover comes again and we find bliss together. And while the eyes of the whole hall were riveted upon her, she plunged the dagger she had taken from her lover's belt into her heart. For a second she stood swaying, then she crumpled and fell beside the English lord. Black George caught her and held her in his arms. My curse upon you, Black George, he cried. Black George could also curse. Never shall you leave Rougemont to find your lover, and never shall he come until... And then his voice died away, as her head fell backward over his arm. The fair lane was beyond his reach. For a minute more, the people in the great hall were paralyzed by the force of the terrible words that they had heard. But with the girl's death, they were released from the spell and a fury swept over the men. They rushed upon the women and dragged them forth. Black George took Elaine's body and carried it away, and there he buried her, no one knew, nor could any discover, for the next day he was found in the great hall, raving mad, and the people said that Elaine's curse was a potent one, that already it had wreaked vengeance on the one who had wronged her most. From that day the chateau was called Rougemont, the Dehar courts were all dead and the place fell into other hands. Then there grew up the rumor that the chateau was haunted, that the fair lane roamed through its halls, cut off from her lover and doomed to stay within these walls by Black George's curse. De Lacy silent, Rexler and I looked at the portrait. My own feelings were in turmoil. It had been a ghost's lips that had touched mine last night. Yet, surely no ghost could have been so beautiful or seemed so real. Rexler turned to me. It would be the curse that has always been upon me, that when I fell in love it would be with a ghost. His eyes were vivid, shining brightly in his pale face. I knew when I saw her on the stairway that I loved her. There is a rumor, said the Lacey, that the man who sees the fair lane will meet with some misadventure, unless she gives him a kiss. Then he is protected from her wrath. I started. Rexter smiled. She kissed me with her eyes. I am not afraid. The fair lane makes men suffer to make up for the wrong Black George did her. For years she has not been seen at Rougemont. Last night, when you described her, I was afraid, my lord. The lacy turned to me. Send your friend away. If she only looked at him and smiled, there is a grave and deadly danger for him. More deadly because it may be unexplainable. Men upon whom the fair lane has smiled have met strange deaths. As Rexler looked up at the portrait, an inward light came upon his countenance. I am not afraid, he repeated. There are many deaths. There is the death of the spirit as well as that of the body. I beg you to go while there is time, friend of my lord. There was real feeling in De Lacy's voice. I too felt afraid for Rexler. The strange, unworldly feeling he had always had, the pulling towards something he knew not what, made me doubly fearful. Had the fair lane been calling him all this time across the world? 
For myself, I had no fear. She had kissed me, and besides, even death at her hands would have been preferable to never seeing her again. In these last few minutes, I had realized that I, too, was in love with Elaine, that I could hardly wait for the night in hopes that she might visit me again. Resolutely, I put my own feelings in the background, for at the moment, Rexler was of paramount importance. If there was anything in the Lacey story, and from my own experience, I was sure there was, Rexler was in danger. I turned to him. If anything happened to you, I could never forgive myself. Perhaps you'd better go. I could arrange a trip for you and later meet you. Somehow the Lacey seemed one of us. I had no hesitancy in speaking before him. He seemed a part of my new life. With a strange suddenness that comes on rare occasions, we were already friends. Rexler looked at me, then back at the portrait. Helene de Arcourt, her red hair gleaming, smiled down upon us. Before he spoke, I knew what he would say, because in his place I would have said the same. Unless you kick me out, I want to stay. I put my hand on Rexer's shoulder. So be it. Come along, let's see the library then. We'll know all of Rougemont. We've seen everything else. Wrenching his eyes away from the portrait, Rexler followed us. The library was beautiful with paneled walls that had rows and rows of books sunk in their depths. There was a long oaken table and on the center of it stood a carved gilded box, the casket which held my father's letter. I wished then that I could read it at once. I wish now that I could have, but perhaps it is better that I did not. At least things moved at the fates ordained and the responsibility for what occurred was not mine. The next three days were quiet, happy ones. Nothing occurred. I had no ghostly visitant, and Rexler saw nothing of Helene. Under De Lacy's expert guidance, we rode over the estate, hunted with falcons, a pleasing sport, which we both took to our hearts, mingled with my court, found the people charming and highly cultivated. We took lessons in the old dances, visited the manor houses. It was all very gay and amusing, and I had no longing for the outside world. I did not even go down to the lodge for news. There were many details of the estate management that I had to go into with De Lacy. We spent several hours each morning going after the affairs of Rougemont. It was virtually a small kingdom, and everything was referred to me. Necessarily, the time I spent with De Lacy on such matters, Rexler was alone. He had changed a great deal since we had come to Rougemont. He had come alive, and he threw himself into everything with a curious intensity. He was like a person who had been very ill, who suddenly finding himself better and fearing it is only temporary, clutches life with both hands. He devoted long hours to reading the records of the Dehar courts until he knew the family history as well as his own. I did not mention Elaine, although there was seldom a moment when she was out of my thoughts. I found myself watching for her day and night, and I caught the same intention in Rexler's eyes as he searched the shadows. The third night she came again, not to me, but to Rexler, and although he was my friend, I almost hated him because he had seen her and I had not. He told me next morning as we walked along the lakeshore. Jim, he said suddenly, I saw her last night. She came to my room. She drew aside the curtains of the bed and leaned over me. I can't describe my sensations. It was almost as though life were suspended in space, like a bridge over a timeless sea. I had nothing to say. I knew so well how he felt. She leaned closer and closer to me, Rexler went on. Then she smiled, and before I could find my breath to speak, she was gone. This is the second time she has smiled at me. I felt a nameless fear as though there was a threatening quality in those red lips. She looked at me as though I might have been Black George himself. In that moment, all my envy was swept away by anxiety for my friend. Indeed, I wish she had kissed him, for then he would have been safe. I started to speak, to beg Rescler to leave Rougemont, but before the words could leave my mouth, I saw her. She was standing in the path some distance away directly in line with my eyes, and she was shaking her head impressively. I knew instantly what she meant. I was not to send Rexler away. 
He could not see her because at the moment he was facing me, his hand on my arm. His fingers touching me were not quite steady. It brought me back to reality. Rexlar cried, you could leave Rougemont. Her eyes clouded with anger. She looked at me reproachfully, commandingly as though I were dreaming. I heard my own voice. I don't want you to go. I would be lonely without you. Perhaps there is no danger. Rexler looked at me curiously. There is risk, I know that, but I do not care. I'm like a man who has eaten a strange and terrible drug, who knows the danger, but cannot resist it. I will stay. Beyond him, Helene smiled, a satisfied smile, as she looked at Rexler's broad back. It made me feel afraid. Then suddenly her gaze swept to me, and the smile changed into a languorous one that promised all things. My heart beat faster and I forgot my fear. Rexler moved restlessly, turning so that we were side by side. Even in that second, Helene had vanished. How, I do not know. One minute she was there, the next she was not. We walked along slowly. Finally, Rexler spoke. No matter what happens, and I mean that widely, my friend, you are not to regret. For a little time, I have been happy. I have come alive. I have loved, even though the woman that I love is a wraith. I have felt a sensation I thought never to feel. If I could hold her in my arms and press my lips to hers, I would count the world well lost. I could say nothing because God pity me. I knew just how he felt. The day slipped away quickly. I did not see Elaine again, but Rexler did. Almost every day, he met her in the Rose Garden where they spent long hours. He told me that she was always elusive, but at the same time promising that someday she would be kinder. He said her voice was like golden honey and that without her, he could not face life. Once I saw them myself as I came from an interview with De Lacy. As I approached the Rose Garden, through an opening in the arches, I saw them sitting side by side on the marble bench, and of the two, Helene looked the more earthly, for Rexler had grown paler and more ethereal every day. His eyes were luminous as he looked at her adoringly. She saw me first, and her lips curved sweetly. She rose in a leisurely fashion, turned her back to me, and dropped a low curtsy to Rexler. Then, while I still watched, she extended one slender hand to him. He bent over it, his lips touched its soft whiteness. A little laugh, like the tinkle of silver bells, swept through the garden. Then she was gone. Rexler stood like a man in a trance. I came quickly forward. You are playing with fire, I cried. Rexler roused. You saw? I nodded. Have you ever seen anything more beautiful, more lovely? I shook my head. I'm not afraid anymore. She has promised me. But what Helene had promised, I was not to know, for Rexler's mouth shut with a snap. When I pressed him, he shook his head. Finally, he said, carefully choosing his words with a reluctance that was strange to him. To me is to be granted something beyond the knowledge of mortal man. I can tell you no more, but someday you will know. There was an expression on his face that transcended earth. The next night, I spoke to De Lacy and told him my fears. Rexler was spending more and more time in the Rose Garden. I hardly saw him and he would not discuss anything with me. Even at the stately, elegantly served meals, he barely spoke. He always seemed to be listening, waiting. De Lacy shared my fears, but he suggested nothing to help. He has been marked, my lord, he said gravely. We can only pray. And even in prayers, there is no refuge, for Elaine is beyond such things. Surely, I began to remonstrate. The power of evil is as strong as the power of good, or at least there is little between them. Helene herself is bound fast by hate of Black George. Curses live. I knew that. Witness the lasting quality of the curses and spells of the Egyptian priest. But Helene was not evil. I said as much. De Lacy shook his head. She is cut off from her lover. She does not feel kindly toward men. 
Remember, she promised vengeance century after century that day in the Great Hall. That night, in the silence of my chamber, I called her name. Elaine, Elaine, I flung my agonized summons into the night, but there was no answer. I went over in my mind the tales the Lacey had told me of the havoc she had caused, how one man had cast himself down from the highest turret, crying her name, how another had been found dead in the rose garden, horror frozen on his face. There were still others who had looked upon her, and death or madness came as a result. The more I thought of these tales of terror, the more I feared for Rexler. At last, I could stand no more. I thrust my arms into the rich velvet robe that had taken place of my bath gown and went to Rexler's room. The guards stood back to let me pass. I did not mean to wake him, but some inner foreboding made me feel I must know that he was safe. As I drew aside the curtains of his bed, I could not entirely stifle the cry that came to my lips, for the bed was empty, but upon the pillow lay a small white rose. It was the kind they use in funeral wreaths in France. My heart almost stopped beating. The rose garden, or perhaps the library. A more normal thought struck me. Rexler might have wanted to read. I rushed into the hall to find the lacy waiting for me, summoned by the guards. He held a silver candlestick in which a tall white candle burned. The library, I gasped. That was nearest. We should try it first. De Lacy knew my meaning. He had instantly grasped the situation, and his face was white and tense. Together we descended the curving stairway. Together we reached the library. Then, motioning the lacy behind me, I swung open the door. The room was brightly illuminated, although not one of the candles had been lit. In the middle of it stood Rexler, with Elaine in his arms. Their lips were closed locked. It was a picture that an artist would have delighted to paint. The stiff crimson skirts of Elaine D'Arcourt's gown stood wide on either side, and Rexler's blue doublet and hose against them was in bold relief. His long oversleeves edged with fur hung gracefully. I could not speak. This mating of man with ghost was almost more than my poor mortal brain could bear. Yet with every atom of my being I wished that I would have been in Rexler's place. I remembered the one chaste kiss I had had from her, and I almost fainted at the thought of possessing those lips for my own, as Rexer's was doing. Strangely enough, mingling with this emotion was another, a feeling of fear and anxiety for my friend. Cold horror that froze my blood kept me rooted to the spot. Behind me the lace he had fallen to his knees. I could hear him repeating the Latin words of a prayer, all that once I saw where the light was coming from. The entire north wall, ordinarily lined with books, had gone. In its stead was a stone wall, and in the corner of the wall was a low-hung Gothic door, carved in ornate. It was standing open, and beyond was a pale, luminous yellow mist. I could see nothing of what else was beyond the door, for the yellow haze filled the entire space. It was like a golden fog, and its radiance lighted the library with a strange, unearthly glow. Its luminosity glowed upon Elaine and Rexler like a spotlight. For a moment I thought Rougemont, De Lacy, everything of the past weeks must have been a dream and that I was watching a cinema of past days. All at once, before my astonished eyes, Elaine gently drew her lips away from Rexler's. She slipped from his arms and extended her hand to him. Come, I heard her say. Rexler had been right. Her voice was like golden honey. It was like the music of willow trees in early spring. Rexler grasped her hands. For the first time, I saw his face. Joy transfigured it, such joy as I have never seen before and never shall see again. Helene moved forward, slowly but surely, drawing him toward the little gothic door that stood open. With her soft lips half parted, she whispered, Come. Rexler, I cried suddenly. He did not hear me. As he looked into her eyes, he might have been a bird charmed by a snake. Nothing could break through that spell that bound him. They were near the door. Each second brought them closer to it. Now Helene was on the other side. 
the golden mist concentrated upon her until she looked like a goddess in its eerie light. Rexler! Rexler! The words tore through my throat. Rexler stepped over the threshold. Through the golden mist I saw him clasp Elaine in his arms again. I saw her smile triumphantly at me as she raised her lips to his. There was something in her eyes that filled me with horror. The mist swirled about them until I could barely discover the outlines of their figures through its gleaming haze. Then the door swung slowly shut. I awoke to feverish activity. Rexler, Rexler, I shouted and rushed forward to the door. I grasped the iron ring that hung in its center. I pulled on it with all of my might. When I found that it resisted all my efforts, I began beating against the door itself. Presently, I felt myself being pulled away. There is no use, my lord, the lacy's voice was saying. The door is gone. Gone, I ejaculated, and even as I spoke, I saw what he meant. The north wall of the library was lined with books, as it always had been. I had been beating upon them impotently. I looked down at my hands. The knuckles were raw and bleeding, just as they would have been from pounding on a heavily carved wooden door. The lacy caught my meaning. The door was there, my lord. It was the lost door, the door behind which Black George buried Elaine de Arcourt. It had been lost for centuries. I sank into a chair, weakly now, for the fact that I had lost Rex or my friend was paramount. I will tear down the wall until I find it. That has been done, my lord, and it has never been found. It will never be found again. Only for a brief moment, you and I have been granted a glimpse of something we cannot understand. And Rexler, I groaned. He was happy, the lacy comforted. No matter what happened after, he has had happiness such as I have never seen before. My head pitched forward and I knew no more. Three days passed and later I was escorted to the library by De Lacy to whom, since Reckler's loss, I was more devoted than ever. With great ceremony, I was given the key to the gilded casket, then left alone. Seated in the great chair before the oaken table, I unlocked the casket. It contained many pages closely written in my father's hand. In them were instructions as to my future conduct, my care of Rougemont, what he had done and what he expected me to do. But the lines that interested me most were these. I bought Rougemont for your mother shortly after your birth, because when riding through this country she saw and loved it. It was a purchase that cost me dear, for Rougemont held a curse and an avenging spirit in the form of a beautiful young girl who could not bear to see others' happiness, so my wife died. Two months after your mother's death, I first saw La Belle Elaine. We fought a long battle, she and I but I was strong, my son, because I loved your mother. No other woman's charms could lure me to my doom. Finally, I made a bargain with a ghost. She hated modern things and longed for Rougemont to be great again. I promised to restore the chateau to its former splendor, to make it just as it was when it had been during her days. And in return, she promised immunity to me and afterwards to you and to all my court when I should have established it. I restored Wishmont. I repeopled it with her help and advice. I have made it as it was in her own day. She showed me the hidden treasure vaults of the dark courts so that I would have enough money to purchase the things she wanted. She too has kept her bargain for I and my court have lived happily here unmolested. Only when an outsider came or someone disobeyed or longed for the outside world did she wreak vengeance. She has sworn to give you the kiss that promises immunity the night you come. Only beware, my son, whom you bring here from the world you know, and beware of the lovely Elaine. Old man as I am, devoted to your mother's memory as I am, she can still make my pulses leap. Above all things, if she shows you the lost door, do not be tempted to cross its threshold, for that way 
unless you are the reincarnation of the Englishman, annihilation lies. There was more, pages more of other matters, but I left them for another day. Alone there in the library, I let my eyes wander to where the little gothic door had been. Had Rexler been the Englishman, come back to earth to claim his bride? Could that account for the strange, unsatisfied longing he had always had, his unearthly feelings, his unlikeness to other people? Or was he Black George, lured back to Rougemont for Elaine's vengeance? I hope for his sake that was not the explanation, that he and Helene would find bliss waiting for him behind the lost door, and I would never see Helene again. The days pass. I do what my father set out for me to do. I keep his bargain with the ghost of the fair Lane. I never leave Rougemont. I have no desire to, for I am always hoping that someday I shall again find the lost door.